So I am so excited to be in church today. We're going to be starting a brand new sermon series that we're going to kick off today. And as Pastor Jessica said, can y'all believe that Easter is only four Sundays away? Four Sundays away, and we are already, we will arrive at Easter. Praise God, he's alive. And uh, so I really, I'm really, I'm always excited about new sermon series and new messages, right? That's why I'm a pastor. I, I love to study the word and I love to, to have Holy Spirit filled messages. But I, I'm just, I want you guys to join me in prayer and expectation. I really feel like this message today that we're going to start is really going to be a primer for us. Do y'all know what that means? A primer. He's going to get us ready. Somebody say Ready. Are y'all awake? He wants to get us ready for what he wants to do on Easter. Praise God. So let's look at that title of our message today, our sermon series that we're going to be on for the next four weeks to get us to Easter. This is the title. The title is The Value of One. Y'all say that with me. The Value of One. If you got a neighbor, you're sitting next to somebody today, tell them this. You matter. You matter, right? The value of one. And because you matter, you know, you were created in the image of God. Because you matter, guess what that means? They matter. And you're not better than them, and they're not better than you. Because you matter, Jesus proved that every person matters, right? That means your neighbor matters. And that means there's a lost, dying world that needs to know that they matter, that there is a plan, that there is a future, that there is a hope in Christ for them. So as we, I'm really excited to, 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 to dive deep into this, this topic and this theme of, of the value of one. And what we're going to do is we are going to be in the, the 15th chapter of Luke for this whole sermon series. And I really want to encourage you guys to this week, I want you to read the whole chapter. Because everything that we're going to talk about the next three weeks is going to be pulled directly from Luke chapter 15. And there's only 32 verses, so y'all can accomplish that this week. Amen? I want you to join me in prayer. And what we're going to see is Jesus, I never even noticed this. Most of the chapter, Jesus is talking about the parable of the prodigal son. Y'all heard that story? The lost son, who the wayward son who came back. But before that, there's three parables that Jesus preaches on. He preaches on the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Can I get an amen? And I never noticed that he he does it back to back to back. And so each week, that's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on each one. Somebody say one. We're talking about the value of one, right? So today I'm excited. We're going to We're going to start the beginning of of chapter 15 in in Luke, and we're going to talk about the value of the lost sheep. So we we have to see this, guys, the value of one. And I'm going to talk about that because I feel like sometimes we can get get overwhelmed when we see how crazy the world is and we see the world as lost as it is and how how, how the craziness seems like it's just taking over, right? Is that just me? And sometimes I got to be careful. I get into this discouraging place. And the Lord just reminded me this week, you know what? You don't have to save the whole world all at once. You just got to focus on one person at a time, one soul at a time, one person, one sheep. We're going to talk about that today, that Jesus equated people to sheep. And so I'm excited to, 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 to dive into this with us for the next couple of weeks. So let's, let's open our Bibles together. Who brought their Bible today? Their, their sword. You got it? Let's open up to Luke chapter 15. We'll go ahead and read it together. We're going to read verses 1 through 7 as we kick this off. And so we are starting right there. At the beginning, we're talking about the parable of the lost sheep. It might be uh, headlined or titled that in your Bible. But look at verse 1. It says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Did you ever notice that? It says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners. That stuck out to me this week. Notorious sinners came to listen to Jesus preach. It says, This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complained that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. Everything after verse 1 and 2 in chapter 15 of Luke is all red letters. Everything that Jesus preaches and teaches for these next 
30-something verses, there's 32 verses, he is speaking and teaching and preaching directly to what the Pharisees think and see themselves as better than others. Totally related to verse 1 and 2 is this is Jesus' response. So look at verse 3. It says, so Jesus told them a story. Verse 4, if a man had a hundred sheep and one, what's the title of our message? One, the value of one. And, and Jesus says, if a man had a hundred sheep and one of them, just one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others into the wilderness and go and search for the one, there it is again, that the lost one is until he finds it. And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together all his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy. Y'all say that with me. More joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over the 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Can I get an amen? There is inherent value in every single person. And so Jesus says, how much more joy in heaven happens when, when one lost soul returns? How much more joy? And so we have to see this, guys. I know some of us, we've been following God, right? We've been following God for maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Keep following God, but don't forget why we're following God. You're following God because one day you were that sheep. Am I speaking to any lost sheep? I was lost. Ian was lost, but praise God, now I am found. Ian was blind, but praise God, now I am See, and because God found me, praise God, I want to help find others. This is the thing you got to know. You know, when something's lost, when something gets lost, it'll stay that way until somebody finds it. Amen. It's the same with people. If people are lost, nine times out of ten, they won't be found until somebody goes and finds them. The prodigal son, I, I am a prodigal son, but I'm so thankful that I made it by his grace to that moment of clarity that happened in my pigsty. But if you sit in the pews and you say, well, so-and-so's off in sin, so-and-so's doing this, so-and-so deserves what they get, so-and-so, hopefully they wake up. What if Ian would have died before I got to my moment of clarity. I'm thankful I didn't, I didn't die. Right? Some people don't make it to that place. So God wants us to facilitate the kingdom of God through faith, inviting others into what God is doing. Can I get an amen? amen. Do we have any God seekers in the place? I hope you came to seek God today. I hope you didn't come to just hear what I have to say or, or hear the worship team. They're awesome. I love to come and listen. I hope you came to seek God today. I hope that's why you're here. If you are a God seeker, you need to hear me. That means you should be a people finder. If you're a God seeker, you need to be a people finder. We can't be in hiding anymore. The Lord showed me I feel like there's a lot of Christians in the world that are hiding They've been born again. They was lost, now they're fine. They were blind, now they see. But they're, they're, they're dealing with things. We all got things we're dealing with. We all got junk. But, they're, but they're, they're supposed to be seekers. They're playing a game of hide and seek. They're supposed to be seeking for the kingdom of God, helping others, loving others, forgiving others. But instead, they're dealing with so much of their own stuff, they can't get past seeing what's going on in their lives. They are hiding from the things of God. We can't change the world and turn it upside down for his glory if we're hiding, guys. And we got Easter four weeks away, and there are people that are lost. They're, they're desperate. They're hopeless. They want some hope. And guess what? That means they may come to church. And I hope they do. I hope they come. I hope these seats are packed here and in Arab. And it's a moment for people to say, you know what? Maybe this Jesus guy is real. 
And we need to be God seekers and people finders for his glory. So look at that first point today. As we just read, that parable of Jesus says, right? He describes lost people as lost sheep. In each parable, he reinforces the idea that one soul, one life, literally every person matters to God. And if they matter to God, they should matter to us. Can you all agree that our world is lost? Praise God there are saved and, and found people in it. But as I was saying at the beginning of this, we can't be disillusioned. We can't be discouraged. We can't be dissuaded by that mass numbers of people that are, are lost. And we need to see the value in one. Did you see what Jesus said? He said, won't the, won't the shepherd leave the 99 to go after the one? Try to wrap your mind around that. He has 99 sheep. We would think that's more valuable than if I just had one sheep, right? Right? But not one of us, if that was your son or your daughter, are you going to let one just wander off? No. So God is saying there is value in one. The same value that I have in all these 99 that are doing what they're supposed to be doing is the exact same, somebody say same, as this one sheep that has wandered off, that is lost, that is discouraged. That may be, may be not just lost. Maybe some are evil. Maybe some are, are doing evil. We're going to talk about that. I, I really want to drive home a point today that just because I'm a lost sheep, it doesn't mean I'm necessarily even evil. Now, are there evil people? Yes. Are there people doing evil? Yes. But I believe there are literally people that are just lost. They've been brainwashed by the world, by the school systems, by Facebook and Instagram and our cell phones. And they're lost and they don't even know it, right? So our world is full of lost people and we can't be disillusioned by that. Every, every person matters to God. Think, especially the lost ones. Especially the lost sheep, lost people. I believe there's a special place in God's heart for people that are lost. And guys, there is no place in this church for that statement or that thought that says, I'm better than so and so. I'm part of the 99. I done whoop that drinking. I done whoop that alcohol. I done whoop. The pornography, I don't whoop that. I'm part of the 99. I'm better than they are. We don't have room for that. That's not, that's not the heart of God, right? And if that's where you're at today, you, I never want, I have to, Liberty Church is a place for everybody, but if that's where you're really at, this might not be the place for you. Because that's not the heart of God as we just read. If God really found me and, and brought me back into his good favor, into his good grace, that should really move me to a place of compassion that says, you know what? I, I'm not better than anybody, but you know what? I want to get better with you. Yeah. Right? I'm not better than anybody, but let's get better, to get, let's get better together, right? Come on, somebody. Yeah. None of us are perfect. We're all getting better day by day in pursuit of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So look at that next point. Look what it says. I kind of already touched on this for a moment. Look, it says, lost sheep aren't evil sheep. They aren't rebellious sheep. They are lost sheep. They've wandered off the path and have gotten turned around. So that's what I'm saying. We, yes, we have people. We have rebellious people. And, th and that's really, we invite those types of people. We have to pray for those people that the Lord reveals to us, you know, this person's in rebellion. They, they are stuck in pride. They they are in evil. We, we really have to approach those people differently than we do somebody who is the Holy Spirit. He'll say, oh, this person is just lost. You know, this person, he's, they've been abandoned. This person, they didn't have parents. This person's been raised on social media. This person's been raised by the, the public education system. This, this person doesn't even know really right from wrong. This, we have a world full of these types of people. Do you see that? 
And this is really the types of people that I think the Lord wants to just, they, we don't want them woke, but he wants them to be awakened spiritually. A lot of people have heard Jesus, but a lot of people don't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Come on, somebody. When I, I, know, I knew about Jesus when I was lost, but it wasn't until I knew Jesus and you know what I'm saying? It wasn't until I knew him and then he knew me that then I became awakened to spiritual things. And he began to transform my life and parts of my life instantaneously in a moment. I saw that I was dead, dying, going to hell in a moment. I, I said, oh my, thank you, God, that I did not die, that, 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 that you brought me to this place. And you know what? This is going to be daunting. This is going to be a long journey. I got a lot of things that I need to happen and need to, for you to accomplish in my life. But you know what? I'm here. And I'm going to trust you with my, life. And I've, I, with my life. And I've had bruises. I've had bumps. I've had ups. I've had downs. I've had highs. I've had lows. But Jesus is still the same. Somebody say the same. Yesterday and today and forevermore. And his love and his grace and his compassion is good and available to us. So if we say a lost sheep is just lost, they've wandered off. And you know what sheep they are? They are an actual sheep. Let's think of a sheep for a moment. They're just, they're very innocent animals. They're very, they need a shepherd to help them, to, to help meet their needs and meet their supplies. And so, but, but sheep are very, they're just, they're innocent. Even people at times, we're, we're very now, without the Holy Spirit, our flesh can accomplish some evil things, but at, at, a lot of times we're, we're just innocent. We have good intentions. And, and before I know it, if I'm not, I'm purpose following God. I've done wandered off into all sorts of rabbit trails, places, people, places, and things. And before I know it, I don't know why I feel this way. I don't know why my life is such a mess. I don't know why I can't stand people. A lost sheep doesn't know that it's lost. Have you ever lost something? Nobody. I hope the preaching ain't that bad. You'll fall asleep. <clears throat> Remember, I lost, uh, I used to collect football cards. I used to have a bunch of Barry Sanders. Who knows who Barry Sanders was? Emmett Smith, a bunch of them, a bunch of hands. Man, I don't know how much money I had in them cards, and I lost them. And some, I don't know if they've ever been found. I never found them. Something that's lost will stay lost until it's found. But a lost sheep, like unlike a thing that gets lost, a, a, a lost sheep oftentimes doesn't know it's lost. It's just wandering. I want to tell a story. It's a couple months ago, and me and the wife and the boys were at Chick-fil-A, the holiest places of holy places, right? Other than the church for dinner. <laughs> And guys, a few parents, any parents in the house, have you ever lost your kids? Well, your pastor lost his kid for a moment. Pastor Jessica was out with Bodie, sitting in the booth, doing their thing, and I was in the play place with Xander, and he was doing his thing, playing. And I was watching, 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 and then he went out the door, and uh, I knew Jessica and Bodie was there, so I didn't really think much of it. A few 30 seconds, maybe a minute goes by. What do I do? Pull up my phone. Scroll on my phone. Y'all don't do that, do you? <clears throat> then kind of a little time clock goes off my eyes. It's been a couple minutes. I look, I turn my head. Jessica and Bodie are not there. So I'm like, what? I go out. I'm looking. Xander, Xander. <clears throat> a couple people are sitting looking at me. And then all of a sudden, my heart starts beating on my chest a little bit. Y'all know that feeling? Anybody ever felt that feeling? I started getting sweaty. I said, did y'all see my son? They said, no. I said, Xander. I started, my voice started getting kind of high. Xander. Xander. Y'all see my son? No. I go outside. Xander. I, I think, is, what if he gets, goes out in the parking lot? He's very adventurous. He gets that from his dad, I think. He wasn't out there. Just about the moment I said, you need to go check the bathroom. Then comes Jessica, Xander, and Bodie. And all in a moment, everything is good, but Jessica's kind of giving me that look, right? <laughs> Do you know where he came? He came into the bathroom. But then I share all that, and praise God, he's, he was lost, but now he's found. But I share all I have to say is, 
Xander had no idea that he was lost. But this is what I want you to see. This is how cool your God is. Who did it affect? The Father. Did you hear what I said? Xander had no idea he was lost. But the Father sure did. And there's no way, think of this, how crazy would this be? If we just couldn't find Xander, and we said, well, let's go on home. We got Bodie with us. We'll go home and get a nap and call it good. That would never happen, right? Because there's value in one. Come on, somebody. I still have one that's found, but I had one that was lost. And so, church, this is what you got to see as we're getting to come up upon Easter. There are lost people that is grieving the Father of God right now. And you may be sitting in the pew singing, I got my fire insurance. I know Jesus. Yeah, but he has a son and a daughter that don't. And God wants to use his church to find them. We said, if I'm a God seeker, I need to be a people finder. And you better believe I was trying to find Xander. I didn't care what I looked like. I didn't care what I sounded like. I was a father in distress. And church, what if we looked like a church that was distressed, looking, finding, loving, forgiving, inviting people to church to hear truth and to experience a real God? All right, look at Matthew 9. We're going to read 35 through 38, but I want to read just... 9, um, 35 through 36 first. Look what it says. It says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of the area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing to the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, listen, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were confused and helpless. Like what? Like sheep without a shepherd. If we know that our world is lost, we've all agreed on that already. If we know that our world is helpless and confused, and if we serve a loving God, we have to be moved in compassion. Literally moved by compassion. Pastor Ian is also a father. When I lost Xander, the, the role of father, you better believe I was a little scared, a little terrified, but I was being moved. I was physically moving, shouting, asking people, looking up under things for my son. Jesus, what did he do? Because he was moved in compassion. Everywhere that he went, he preached and teached. He healed he didn't care what other people thought, religious people thought. He was in the cracks and the crevices, the dark and the light places, loving people, healing people. And so we got to get over the fact of what other people may think about us because I'm so in love with Jesus because Jesus was so in love with me that I don't care what I look like. I am going to look for people to bless, to love, to invite to church, to pray for. I am going to be looking for people. And the thing is, we all know somebody. Probably in our family, a circle of friends, somebody at work. And we need to be literally moved. When you don't have the guts or the faith or the confidence or the boldness to do that thing that the Holy Spirit has asked you to do, you got to ask the Holy Spirit, I need you to stir me with compassion. And if you have compassion moving you, you'll get some things done for the kingdom of God. If you can be moved, literally, by compassion. And you see what Jesus said there in verse 36. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion from the Father fell. So we have to have a compassionate faith that sees people 
sees what they're going through, sees, has the grace to say, you know what, maybe I think about this person this way, but in reality, I have no idea what is really going on in their life. And I done judged them. And I done stamped them. And that's what the world wants to do to you, right? They want to categorize you and label you. And you don't want that done to you. I don't want that done to me. And so I think I know this person. And I've already done, you know what? I've done checked out on them. And I have no idea what's really going on in their life. What has gone on in their life. And that is not compassion. That is, the, that is judgment. God wants us to be living in compassion for others. An inclusive God. Seeing the inherent value in one. In one. Look at the next point. So our world is filled with confused, helpless people like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion for the lost sheep and he commands us to pray. And we're going to read uh, verses 37 and 38 here in a moment. Because he rolls right into what we just read about being moved with compassion for the people for the crowds, and he moves right into the statement that y'all are going to recognize. But what I want you to see is sheep without a shepherd will die. Sheep without a shepherd cannot sustain themselves. People are the same way. Now, Jesus is the shepherd. I know we're in church. Y'all know that, right? But if I'm lost, I'll make all sorts of things my shepherd. Maybe it's a, a friend that I trust. and I'll make them kind of my shepherd, somebody that I trust. Or, you know what, maybe I'm really big into reading books. And I have an author that I really like, and they seem to speak truth. So, you know, I'm going to make this author my shepherd. I, I, I loved rock music growing up. One of my favorite bands was a band called Incubus. And you know what, when I was lost, I thought his music was speaking. When I, I liked it so much because I felt like he was speaking right to me. You know what? I was like, that guy gets me. That lead singer, he gets me. You know what? Those, those, that band's dead, dying, going to hell right now. But I made that band, that lead singer, my shepherd. And guess what? Ian made a lot of bad choices because I made them my shepherd. Sheep will die without a shepherd, and people are the same. And the only shepherd that will lead you to life is Jesus. And this is what we got to remember the church is not the shepherd. The church's responsibility is to lead others to the shepherd. And I feel like we're not one of those churches, but there are some churches, you know what, they feel like maybe we're the shepherd. We got the answers. Just come to us. We'll help you. And that's what we're, we're called to do, right? But if we lose sight of the fact of what we're called to do is leading the people, leading others to the shepherd, we ain't going to make it. And so our job as a church is to lead others to the, to the shepherd and a big way that we do that, I hope as I'm speaking to you, maybe you're thinking of some people that you love and care about that are lost, and you're thinking, man, I don't even know my, my, my first step. I'm, I'm really going to challenge you to invite these people to church this year. We're going to talk about that. But I, I want to show you how simple it is. What, what's my first step? How, you don't have to preach a message. You don't have to say a scripture. The first step is to pray. Say that with me. Pray. A short four-letter Word is to pray. Step one is always prayer. So look at, let's stay there in Matthew 9. Look at verse 37 and 38. It says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful. Y'all remember this scripture? Who's heard it? Right? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, what does it say? Pray. He says, Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. To God, the Lord of the harvest, where everything is in God's hands, right? To send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus is saying this. The possibilities are endless. The possibilities are endless. Think about that. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The possibilities are endless, but the participants are few. We could accomplish so much, Jesus is saying. There's, there's so many things the Father wants to do. There's so many things God wants to do in and through LCHP. He wants to pave our parking lot, but the participants are few. We got less than 10% people who faithfully give their tithes every week. He wants to save lost people. 
He wants to help people pay their bills. But the, 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 the possibilities are endless. The, 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 the harvest is, is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The participants are few and far between to find. He's saying there's, there's souls for the reaping. Lost children, lost sheep that grieve the father. But nobody wants to get off their couch and off their phones and scrub one weekend a month to help at the church because they got all this other stuff going on. I get it. We're busy. We got stuff. We got ball games. We got plays. We got school stuff. But if you really believe and say that Jesus, King Jesus is number one, you can't make out one weekend to serve in the church. Sorry if I'm stepping on some toes today. The possibilities of what God wants to do in and through our church, in and through the church, the global church, in and through his kingdom are endless. But the participants are few. I want to ask you today, are you a willing participant in Liberty Church, Holly Pond? If you are, I'm thankful. Because the laborers are few, Jesus said. And he said, because laborers are few, you need to pray. So I said all that to give you some hope. We can begin to pray to God of the harvest for laborers. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to join me and Pastor Jessica and me and Pastor Keith and Pastor Kelly and you, if you are a, a group leader, a, a seven pillar leader, we got any pillars in the house? Raise your hands. Raise them up high. Thankful for you folks. I want you to join these folks with their hands raised to pray for the laborers to accomplish God's will here and what he wants to do. So we must pray. Look at that next point. You got to see this in prayer. When we by faith pray for other people, identify other people, lost sheep, People, we pursue the lost through prayer. Prayer is our weapon of warfare that brings people out of darkness into God's glorious light. Prayer is how we identify people and begin to pray God's will around them, around their lives, around their families. We identify and we pray and we war for them. We stand in the gap for them. And there's the good news. They don't even have to know that you're praying for them. But every day you're making their battles, their storms, their tests. What are you doing? You're putting their, st their stuff, their junk on your back. Come on, somebody. What if I told you that your prayer life could affect somebody else's life? What if your prayer life has the ability to totally change somebody else's life. Does anybody remember who Pastor Rick was? Rick Laster? Awesome guy, awesome man of God. He used to run our CR and he used to run our, our men's home. And after COVID, they launched their own church. He's pastor at State Free Church now in Arab. But I remember this. I thought it was so weird at first, but then it made so much sense. And if you know Pastor Rick, you, you know he's just, you know, you know what I'm saying? And uh, he, just, he just speaks just regular lingo. And he said, you know what? You just need, he was talking to a mom. She, I used to help do intake at the house. And he was talking to the mom. She'd come in and she's like so distressed. And my son's lost and out there. And, you know, she's telling this story and it's grieving my heart. And Rick's just, he's heard a lot of these stories. And, and not that he wasn't moved in compassion, but he said, you know what? You, you need to just pray that he get arrested and go to jail. And as I was sitting there, I was thinking, man, he's not really giving her much comfort. <laughs> but there's a lot of truth in what he said as we're talking about prayer. What, what was he telling? You know what? You can pray for, if it's going to take somebody to get arrested to go to jail to see the light come on somebody, God can use a jail place. He used it on a lot of disciples, on Paul, on Joseph. And so as we pray for people, Maybe, maybe there's certain things we need to pray God do to, to help shake these people up or wake these people up. And God can use anything. He can use a jail cell. He can use you. He can use a teacher. He can use a grandma. He can use an aunt. He can use an uncle. Right? Nothing's off the table. It's all in God's hands. And so praying for someone is always, you got to know, is always the starting place. 
And when you start with prayer, God begins to then open up divine doors into their life for you to then begin to do the big things that you probably started with in your mind. When I said, I want you to invite somebody to church, you immediately went to the big places. I don't know enough scriptures. Or I don't know what I'm going to say. And God wants you to start with prayer. And if you can begin to pray for somebody for, for 10, 20, 30 days, we've got 30 days until Easter. If you can begin to pray for them for 30 days, maybe God can begin to prepare their hearts before you go ahead and invite them. So step one is always prayer, and then God begins to open divine doors. Does everybody get one of these cards that Pastor Jessica was talking about? If you got it, wave it at me. Wave it at me. All right, I want you to look at it. We're talking about the value of one. On the front, we got James 5.16. These are the scriptures we're going to use to pray for some lost people that we're going to invite to church. Romans 14 through 15. Right? And then on the back, I told Pastor Keith, I said, we should have rethought this maybe for a moment. We're talking about the value one. As I was in prayer and studying yesterday, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you know what, we're asking you to invite three people. But what if I asked you just to focus your, all your energy to pray for one? And if every one of us just brought one, if we brought three, right, that's great. That's more than one, but you know what? That's up to you. You pray about it. If you have three people you want to invite, do it. But I feel like the Lord was really showing me maybe he wants us just to focus on one person. And I can put all my eggs in one basket and I can pray. See, praying for three people gets kind of hard when I'm praying for my family and everything else I'm praying about. Now I'm praying for three people. If you want to do that, great. But maybe God wants us to just be focused on one person. The Holy Spirit reveal that one person to you. Pray for them for 30 days. And then the week before Easter, say, hey, you don't even have to tell me you've been praying for them. You say, I would really love for you to come to church this Sunday. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be powerful. And you can come as you are. If you want to wear holy jeans, not H-O-L-Y, but H-O-L-E-Y, right? Holy jeans. Come as you are and watch God move. Does that sound good? So y'all don't lose this card, okay? I want you to pray about it, pray over it. If you want to invite three people, praise God. If you want to do like I said and just focus on one person, you do that. Amen? Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 3-4. Three, three it says, if, we preach, uh, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. And so if you can be a willing participant in the things of God, God will use your life to help somebody in need. But you can't be in hiding like we're talking about. You can't be hiding what God's done in your life behind a veil. Eventually what God's done in you, he wants it to manifest and to spread to others. Any contagious Christians in the house? You got that contagious faith, right? That just gets on everybody when they get around you. They just... They just, they're more loving, they're more caring, they're, they're more joyful. It's that what God has done in you, right? When it comes upon you, it begins to spread from you and get on others, right? If you can be willing, God will use your life to help somebody in need. And prayer is a starting place, but prayer always, somebody say always, leads to the rest. Prayer, if you pray for them and then go to them, Prayer always is a starting place. It always leads to more. It always leads to teaching and preaching and loving and helping and listening. Prayer always leads to more. Look at that last point for today. And so if we're saying that lost, lost people, lost sheep are lost and they don't know it, you got to remember this. Sheep are defenseless animals. They're easily confused and helpless against the enemy. When we labor in prayer, it removes the, the blinders from the enemy, and prayer brings the revelation, conviction, and intervention of God into their lives. A lost person, a lost sheep, will stay lost without divine intervention. I'm thankful that I had a divine intervention with the Holy Spirit in my pig spot, in my pig sty. But really, before that happened, there were people praying for me first. My mom was praying for me. My aunts were praying 
for me. It took them to actually ask me if I wanted to go to a place called Teen Challenge. And I was like, what? I'm not going to some dumb place. Yeah, your pastor said dumb place called Teen Challenge. I'm not a teenager. I'm in my mid-20s. And I had to calm down and listen to what they were saying. And it was really, you know what? Probably the Holy Spirit speaking to them and saying, you know what? Your life's a mess. You need something different. And I said, yes. There was divine intervention through others, through prayer, through invitation. And so here's the good news. The divine intervention could start and stop with you. If you got a neighbor nudging with your little elbow, say, it could start with you. It could start with you. Right? Maybe God wants to use you, the goodness in you, the light in you, to encourage and invite somebody else out of the darkness into the light. Look at 1 Peter 5.8. It says, Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking who, what? He may devour. Because the devil is out to get you. You believe that? Guess what? He's out to get them too. The devil's out to get you. I know you don't like that about him and about you because there's a scheme of the enemy against your life. But if they're lost, truly, truly lost, don't know what's really going on, here's the difference is you know better. You know there's a scheme against their life. They think it's just bad luck. They think it's just bad coincidence. They think the world's just out to get them. You know the truth. You know, you know it's, it's, you're a child of God and the devil hates you. And because you know the truth, God wants to use you to impart hope and to impart faith. This where you come in, right? You've been set free. They haven't yet. Maybe God wants to use the freedom inside you to help set them free. Look at 2 Timothy, our last scripture for today. 2, 25 through 26. It says, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. <laughs> Did you see what that said? Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Ah, the Lord's working me on, on that. Because some of these folks that are out there doing evil, they're so stuck in pride, they don't... They don't receive a gentle answer, right? And it's like, I want you to hear the truth and what is going on. And the Holy Spirit's like, gently. Gently instruct those. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. Did you know that? And kindness. Who oppose the truth. And get this. When I can move myself out of the equation and just do what God called me to do, I can let God do what he's called to do because he's God. What does it say? God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Amen. It's God's job. He wants to use me, but I'm not God. He wants us, don't try and do God's job. Just partner with God, right? Do you see that? Partner with God. Let him use you, but let God do the God stuff and let you do the sheep stuff and it'll all work out for his good. Can I get an amen? Amen. Right? Look at verse 26. They will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him. When you're lost, I said, you won't, you'll stay that way until somebody finds you. They're held captive by the things of this world. The deceiver, who is actually the God of this place, it says, has captivated them. And God wants to change their hearts. Right? When we let God do his job and, and, and us do our job, like we're saying, us just be the sheep, we're just the messengers, and God's the transformer. Right? God's equipped us with the message of the gospel. We're to be messengers of the gospel, but it's not my job to change their heart. That's God's job. And it says he transforms those. Right? He transforms those. And the Bible says if he can change the heart of a king, he changed the heart of Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Who was killing Christians? If he, he can change his heart, why can't he change that person's name that you wrote on that card? Have you judged that person? Have you said things like, you know what, they're too far lost. They're too stubborn. What if God wants you to partner with him through prayer for that name 
And then the week before Easter, he wants you to just do your part so that God can do his part. Amen? Y'all join me in prayer. Praise God. I hope you enjoyed the message today and hope the Lord spoke to you. Hope something I said made sense today and stuck to you, to your spirit, your spirit man or woman today. Thank you for joining us online today too. And as we close, we've been talking about lost sheep all day. I guess it's assumed that because we're in church, a lot of us are born again and saved. We're, we were lost, but now we're found. I never want to preach a message without giving the opportunity for somebody to accept Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So if you're, if you're already born again, pray for the lost right now, please. Pray for our lost world. If you want to begin praying for a name, if you already put a name on that card, maybe begin praying for that person right now. But if you're here in the sanctuary or watching us online and you say, Pastor Ian, that's me. You're talking about lost sheep today. That, I feel like that's me. I'm lost. I, I need truth. I, I've never prayed that prayer to accept Jesus Christ into my life. And something you said today changed that. I want to I wanna accept God's Son today into my life. If that's you, I want you to do something for me right now. Nobody's looking at you. But if you're here in the sanctuary, I want you to stand up. If you're in our sanctuary right now, I want you to stand up and say, hey, I want to accept and pray for Jesus to come into my life, for my life to be changed. Amen. I'm going to give you a few moments. No one's going to look at you. But I want you to stand for him. If you're watching us online, I want you to put something in the chat for us. Say, I'm praying that. I'm making that decision. I want to pray to accept Christ. Please put that in there so we can know and we can pray with you. Amen. Amen. I'll give you a few seconds. Amen. Amen. Well, no one is standing in our location, but somebody could be praying this online with us. So I'll lead us on a prayer, okay? Y'all, y'all pray with me. It's going to go like this. Heavenly Father, we love you. We believe in you. We accept your Son. We confess that Jesus is Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my past. And send your Holy Spirit to redeem my future. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.